we had data for almost 250 different steel grids, starting from low carbon to high carbon steels with their respective mechanical properties. And we wanted to look into those predictive variables, which can help us uh, you know, cluster the grades of steels, available grade of steels with us into different groups and subgroups. And we found that the percentage reduction and hardness was super close. But what seemed important was this uh, ES by YS ratio, which is closely related to the strain hardening exponent. So from our given data set, we came up with a new predictive variable, which is called as a ES by YS uh, ratio. Now, this, is, uh, this uh, process is called as a feature reduction technique. So feature reduction, mind you, is a very important task in data science models because it reduces, especially building clustering algorithms, because it helps in reducing the complexity of visualizing uh, data in a three-dimensional or n-dimensional hyperspace. Okay. So uh, before we actually started with building a clustering algorithm, we wanted to see a scatter plot of ES by YS versus percentage elongation. Uh, we did not remove outliers uh, separately from each of the predictive variables. I guess you have uh, uh, read the text that I had shared uh, sometimes back because I mentioned that I'll be using certain terminologies like response variable or predictors, and you should relate that uh, quickly because, okay. So I guess uh, most of you are able to connect it now. Okay. So we wanted to see this uh, scatter plot of TS by YS and uh, percentage elongation. And uh, as I told you, we were not removing outliers separately from each of these predictive variables, but uh, we were uh, more keen to remove those data points in the scatter plot that showed significant deviations from the majority scatter. And the final scatter plot is something which looks like this after removing all these outliers or uh, too much deviated points. Now, outlier removal process is again a part of data cleaning process in data science techniques. And this is very subjective. Let me tell you, you just cannot, I mean, people, those who have attended courses in data science, possibly you may be thinking, oh, this is outlier, let me remove it. This does not happen always in finance. Remember, in finance, outliers are the most important. You have to detect the outliers only, then you can, uh, pretty, I mean, uh, determine the, what do you call, the defaulters or those who have the tendency to make a, a malicious practice. So, so outlier removal, removal, as I told you, is very subjective. You cannot apply in all situations. Sometimes and injuring, injuring problems are really complex problems. You end up with many important uh, variables, which apparently would show you values that looks like outlier, but you cannot uh, uh, I mean, eliminate those things. You have to keep it into consideration. So there are ways uh, that we uh, fine tune the model, with, but I'm not discussing. So the objective is to get you exposed to the primary data science models and get you an understanding how these models at a very elementary uh, stage are able to predict some very simple problems. And this is a problem that I have in hand, okay? So we then applied the k-means clustering algorithm on our scattered uh, data plot. So uh, this uh, technique is called as the unsupervised machine learning algorithm. Unlike uh, supervised machine learning algorithm where you have uh, uh, an input variable, mini input variable and an output variable, and your model is trained on the pattern that is actually established between these input variables and the output variable. And you have a test data that is used to validate the model uh, accuracy and performance. In case of unsupervised machine learning algorithm, you don't have any output in that sense. So the model only captures the pattern that is established between various input variables. And this pattern is used to cluster the data into different groups and subgroups. So that is that makes a difference between supervised and unsupervised machine learning algorithm. And one more point I want to add is, unsupervised machine learning algorithm are never used for predictions. They work on existing data, they're as good as, uh, you know, um, uh, identify a set of data. Uh, that's it. You don't go beyond predicting uh, something in hand, such as an unseen data or unknown data. Those things are all, are all taken care of by supervised machine learning algorithm, not the unsupervised machine learning algorithm, but it is really easy to understand. So for example, if you have a distribution of data points, something like this, uh, the one shown in the left, it is still easy to you know, uh, partition the data into different groups or subgroups. It can be done manually. It is something within the manual approximation, but that may not be the case always. When you have a distribution of data points, something like this, things may go really crazy and it is beyond human uh, approximation. And that is when you need mathematical algorithms to kind of partition the data into different groups or subgroups. And this is a very common technique used in market analytics and e-com. Okay, 
So the way the algorithm works is very simple to understand. So we initially start with uh, randomly assigning some seed points on our scatter plane and the Euclidean distance between each data point you have in the scatter plot and these randomly assigned seed points are all measured. And the closest points to each of these randomly assigned seed points are kind of grouped together and the first cluster is formed. Okay, then we assign something called a centroid to each of these clusters. So what is centroid? So centroid is a statistical measure of the center of the cluster. It could be mean, median, or more. So any measure that gives a sense of center can be used as a centroid. So in the next step, what we do is again measure the distance between each data point and all the newly formed centroids, and then calculate the minimum distance for each newly created centroid with all the data points, and thereby restructure the cluster again. So at every iteration step, you know, the centroids, uh, the clusters are readjusted and so are the centroids. So we keep doing this iteration till we see that the data points in each cluster bear the minimum distance with its respective centroid and no other centroid. So where do we stop or, or terminate the iteration? We stop at that point when we see that something is a, 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 a quality, quantitative measure, which is called as a within cluster sum of squares or WCSS. Okay, so eventually what happens as you keep doing this uh, iteration over and over, this WCSS, which is within cluster sum of squares, I'm not going to discuss how it is measured, just uh, go to internet and uh, it's a very simple technique. So eventually this WCSS should actually come down as we go uh, with time and we increase the number of iterations. And when we see there's a saturation at the end, we stop at that point, we don't want to go further. So that is the idea of this clustering algorithm. So with that, we actually obtained a cluster, uh, three number of clusters when we applied it on our data set. But then how did we arrive to this number three? So we increased the number of clusters having it. So for every different cluster, we have optimized that number of clusters. And we have taken several different cases where we keep increasing the number of clusters after optimizing. And as we keep uh, you know, increasing the number of clusters, you can see the distance that each data point has its uh, has or beer with its respective centroid keeps uh, reducing as you increase more and more number of clusters. Okay, so that is the reason you initially see a sudden drop, a drastic drop in the WCSS with the number of clusters. But beyond a certain number of points, the rate of decrease in the WCSS with respect to the number of cluster remains almost almost constant, or it saturates down. So we actually take that point where you see there is no change in the slope or significant change in the slope as our optimal number of clusters. And that is how we arrive to this number three, okay? So before we perform this, so this can be cross-checked or cross-verified with this plot, elbow method plot, where you can see that this steepness uh, uh, stops after three number of clusters, okay? So before we perform this k-means clustering algorithm, uh, we wanted to make sure that all our predictor variables, importantly, the one that we used here is the TS by YS ratio and the percentage elongation, they are um, normalized to the same scale. So this is called as a feature normalization technique in data science, which is again very important. So this is also called as a feature standardization. And the one that we used here is a Z standardization method where we subtracted each point from its uh, average or the mean and divided by its standard deviation. So what you see here, this TS by YS or percentage elongation, they're all normalized to the same scale. And importantly, what we found here is that this cluster two, which is shaded as green, is of our interest because it uh, identifies those data points which are statistically similar and they have significantly a higher TS by YS as well as a higher percentage elongation. And that is what we are really looking into to have steel grids uh, which are cold workable to bear a higher TS by YS as well as a higher elongation. So our target is therefore to predict any sample or out of the sample steel grid to see if it belongs to class two or not class two. So as of now, I'm calling this as cluster two. So the red is cluster one, the green, the blue is cluster three, and the green is what I call as a cluster two. But from now on, or in, from the subsequent discussion, we'll use the word class instead of cluster. 